um, feel free to be on camera or to not be on camera. Um, you can use the raise your hand function if you know how that works or utilize the chat. And if the chat's not coming up for you, um, just feel free to jump in and and say whatever you need to say. We welcome questions. Um, yeah. So I'm Lauren Kelly, the technical services consultant here at the Department of Libraries. Um, and if this is the first time you you're here, thanks for coming. We're glad you're here. And if it's not, thanks for coming again. Also glad that you are here and to see you again. Um, typically, we do go around and just introduce ourselves, say who we are, where, where we work and um, what ILS system you are using um, just so that we know, get a frame of reference for maybe some of the questions you might have. And if people are coming in, I'll continue to let them in. All right, All right. Um, so I will go through the list of people that I have here um, just to do a little introduction. Um, so we have Deborah first, if you wouldn't mind just saying hello. Hi, I'm Deb Allers from Norwich University. Um, we are an academic library, but we use Dewey unlike, you know, other academic libraries. Nice to meet you all. Yeah, thanks for coming. Um, next we have Janet. Hi, I'm Janet. I'm at the Rutland Free Library and we use Koha. And then Jules is next on the list, if you just want to say hello. Hi there, I'm Jules. I'm at the Vermont Historical Society Library. Um, are we doing ILS? Yeah. Okay, uh, we use like a combo of OCLC connection and then EOS, which is Tier C Dynex. Cool, thanks. Pat is next. Oh, you are muted. Sorry, Pat. Um, I'm from Windhall and we use Koha as well. Awesome, thanks. And Sarah? Good morning, everyone. I am Sarah Luttrell. I'm at Brooks Memorial Library. And I'm sorry, I don't have a camera. Otherwise, I would happily wave to you. That's I am funny. waving right now. Here I am waving. Um, but <laughs> I use Koha for my cataloging system and the awesome. OCLC connection because it's fun. And last but not least, Wendy. Uh, hi, I'm Wendy, and uh, I'm from Bennington Free Library, and we also use Koha. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. All right, I'm going to pull up um, the agenda just so that we can get a look at that. Um, so we just did our introductions, and I'm just going to say that um, the last meeting of this year will be on November 28th. Um, we do meet every three months. Um, and so today we're going to have a nice presentation from Jules, um, who just introduced themselves. Um, and then we'll talk about some other things, hopefully have time for questions. There are a couple of news pieces, um, but nothing too earth shattering, which is good. And then um, I welcome any conundrums or successes and sharing those out as well. All right, I'm going to stop sharing. All right, Jules, if you want to um, take it away, that's fine. Do you have anything that you like? Do you need to share your screen at all? Do I have a little okay. to keep me on task a little bit? <laughs> Do you have the ability to share? I didn't check that before I started today. Uh, I think yes. I'm going to click share and then okay. we'll let you know if we see it. Brilliant. Excellent. Because I'm, I'm more used to um, a okay, screen. I'm more used to Zoom. <laughs> okay, yep. there we go. I think I just want uh, this. So in theory, you can see a window of mine now. Yes, we can Excellent. see your Google Drive slideshow. And I'm going to put it in actual presentation. Center mode, or no, just slideshow. That yes. worked. All right, now we're talking. Okay, hi everybody. Um, I'm Jules. Um, I'm the metadata librarian here at Vermont Historical Society, and I'm just going to give like a really brief overview of how mostly my experience and experience with cataloging here and then dive a little bit into reparative description, which is something that I'm really interested in and that we've been doing like just starting to dip into um, 
as an institution. So I'm just gonna do one thing really quickly. Uh, yes, okay, good. So let me, yes, well, okay. Introduction slide, this is me, it's my name, those are my pronouns. Um, I went to UVM, uh, I got a BA in theater and history, and then I went to Syracuse and got my master's in library science. Um, and currently I'm the catalog and metadata librarian. In the past, I kind of had, I've been very lucky to have a kind of checkered um, career doing a lot of different things in the library so far. I've worked as a cataloger at a public high school in Vermont. I worked at MMU, which is really fun, Jericho. Um, I was, um, for a semester, I did like an archivist internship at Syracuse's student newspaper, which was really fun, but it was, there, it needed a lot. So it was a lot of kind of like um, troubleshooting, not a lot of cataloging. Um, and then previous to this position, as I was finishing up my degree, I was the local history librarian and cataloger at Richard's Free Library in New Hampshire, Newport, New Hampshire, um, which was really fun. They used Koha. I got really familiar with Koha. Um, I got to do a lot of copy catalog, cloud of cataloging, um, and that was really great. So right now, I was hired this past October at VHS, so almost a year ago now, um, specifically to address um, a backlog of cataloging for our single folder manuscript, manuscript collections. Um, and those are typically, they're, you know, they're folder, they're typically um, no more than we tend to cap the amount of things in a folder at like, I've seen like a hundred documents, which like sounds like a lot, but can be pretty, that's like, that's max. Usually I would like reorganize um, if, if it was too big, um, but they're, they're around like a single topic, usually a single person or like a place or like a collection of deeds from one town. Um, and so that's mostly what I focus on when I catalog here. We use DCAS, we use RDA, um, our catalog is almost all the way online. This is part of like what I, I was hired to address, but a lot of it is also, we have like a physical card catalog still too, um, which has really been cool for me to work with, both as like a reference in my ref reference capacity and as a cataloger, because I um, like I used, I used a card catalog when I was like at my public library when I was a kid, but when in like, in like um, library school, we didn't talk about it much other than like, a, this is how it used to be done. Um, and so I've really enjoyed kind of infusing that type of cataloging into my like online cataloging. Um, and then we use LCSH and we use AAT for description for the subject headings. We do have, um, and a lot of this also was in flux. Um, we're like up to, we don't really have a cataloging policy. We're updating a lot of documents right now. We're talking about a lot of things, but we do have the capacity to do um, local subject headings, but right now they're not and I'll get into that a bit more maybe when I talk about directly about reparative um, description, but they're not, our local subject headings right now aren't really used to address problematic subject headings, they're used to um, address subject headings that wouldn't be reflected well within LCSH. Like an example that we use is um, the 1927 flood. We have a ton of information on it specifically for Vermont. And so we tend to like LCSH, I think it's like floods Vermont maybe I think 27 and I, people tend to anyway. So we, we tag it like at 27 flood and that is great. Um, we use Mark. We like I said, OCLC connection, like I catalog an OCLC connection and we upload it to EOS. Um, I this is my this is my first time using that combination of things and I don't mess with the back end of it much, but as a cataloger, OCLC connection, it's a desktop client. Um, it's like fairly easy to like when I need to work from home, um, I can make it work. It's it's a little clunky, um, but it it works. It does what it needs to do. And then EOS, it's very easy to upload. I don't know how the rest of it is, um, but for me, I'm like, this is great. So, um, okay. And then, yeah, so I, this was my first time when working here, my first time cataloging. I had done original cataloging before, but not as much um, in like special library archives. So um one of my challenges when i started doing this was learning how to like incorporate like research and biographical information and um other things like that into the record because a lot of what you know it, i look at like a letter from a person to another person i can just write that or i can like look up and see if we have other letters by them and like if they were an influential figure in vermont's history or like 
other ways to help our patrons kind of look through our catalog. Um, and when um, Kate, who's our head librarian, and Marjorie, who's the assistant librarian, was were kind of training me and telling me what we do um, in terms of cataloging, they emphasized that they really like to like add as much information as possible in, into these these records so that we're creating not only like a searchable catalog, but also, you know, adding um, like it's also part of the archive, like the information, the research that catalogers are doing exists in this catalog and can be cross referenced and um, used for research as well, which has really been fun because I, I do have a history background and I do really like research. Um, and it is really satisfying to take, you know, a folder of letters or deeds or what have you and turn it into like a or you know create a really like robust record that assists researchers in a way that I hadn't really done before um and the against the flip side of that is um since we are cataloging archival material I am fairly frequently coming into contact with words or ideas or images that are dated or offensive or bigoted all of the above um and um the kind of thing that's used to address that, which some or all of you or none of you might know, is reparative description. Um, and that's something that I looked into a lot when I was in school. And I, I really, I think it's a really cool part of our field. And it, um, you know, it uses all of the, all of the things that we as librarians and catalogers feel strongly about, like, um, you know, like description and access and um, being accurate and, you know, taking in our community into mind. And it allows us to catalog in a way that um, is actually descriptive of the people we're talking about, or the things we're talking about. Um, and I, just, I threw up a, a couple of little quotes of, because it's a big topic and it's like a big concept. And it, like, I think that a lot of people also, like a lot of librarians and catalogers do this without realizing they're doing it. Um, so here's a couple, I'll let you guys read the quotes, but um, yeah, it's like updating, contextualizing, um, remediating practices that exclude silence, harm, or mischaracterize marginalized people. I really like that one. Um, yeah, so like inclusive or accurate, inclusive and community centered archival description is really the goal for these practices. Um, and I, um, I think that sometimes also I forget too that description isn't just used in the catalog records, but like especially for VHS, which has the library and then kind of um, has like the education museum department and then like admin and PR and stewardship, like outreach, all these all these folks that are working with us. Um, we put out like VHS puts out a lot of things that use the words that we're using in our catalog to describe the things that we have or the museum exhibits or the um, programs that we're doing. Um, and I, I think that when you're talking about kind of bringing descript uh, reparative description to an organization, it's important to not only think about the cataloging aspect, but like what words are you using in social media and what words are you using in your articles and what words are you using in your museum exhibit layout labels or what have you. Um, we just recently had somebody reach out and say that they had flagged a couple terms in a digital resource that we had put out that was on our website that had been published maybe 10 years ago. And I was like, excellent. I was like, great. Like the more that we can have people coming to us and highlighting these things for us, because as an institution, we put out so much material and it's been put out like over the years and guidance changes and words changes and language changes. And um, that's a huge part of it is, is both kind of addressing what you already put out, whether it's in a catalog or it's in other communique and moving forward. Um, so like, how do you start? It's like, this is like a big thing. Um, I, I definitely can't like explain all of it. I don't, I don't want to like talk too long and I want to leave a lot of room for questions, but um, kind of some of four of the like starts that I like to talk about, uh, the one that's like fairly, not necessarily easy, but can be quick sometimes is a harmful language or content statement. Um, I'm sure I can get the slides to y'all in at some way, but I have a couple links in here. Okay, great. Um, so uh, there's a lot, a lot of institutions have started doing this. Um, academic libraries, museums, archives, public libraries, school libraries, the concept of a, a harmful language statement. You might also see it called a harmful content statement. 
Um, and typically it's it can range from a couple of sentences to like a whole web page. Um, and it just kind of states your institution's mission and or like goals around reparative um, description. And it often, um, you know, lists a way for folks to get in contact if they see something that is troubling to them. Um, it lists, it can like, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of great um, examples out there. And it's like, as we do in libraries, we see things and we, we adapt them for our own institutions. So like, it's totally doable. Um, they can be posted, you know, in, in, con in catalogs, like in like, the, there's a way to do it in Mark. You can have a, I've seen it be like a pop-up um, when you go to a website. Um, so there's all sorts of ways to do that. Um, the next thing to kind of do is to, which is what we're in the process of doing right now at VHS, is establish or revise a cataloging policy and style guide. Um, and that's where you can, you know, put down some guidance about what, um, what, what words you, you're going to, you're going to, um, you know, like replace or amend, um, what words you're not going to use, like what there's, there's, um, all, there's so much work being done by affinity groups, um, and people of communities, um, working to give really excellent resources on how librarians and, and like people in the media can use language in a way that represents their communities in a way that their community needs and wants to be addressed. Um, so like you don't have to do this work yourself. You just kind of have to decide, look at what's out there, have discussions and pick and choose for your institution and your, what you're doing so that um, it can be used in a way and any other way that a, you know, a cataloging policy can be used. So folks can look at it, do what they need to do and kind of make it be a bit more standardized. Um, and yeah, like, there, all these things are living documents, regularly reviewed, things change. Um, and yeah, exactly an emphasis on guidance from communities with the lived experience to speak with authority on best practice. Um, it's really important to both train your current staff and like bring these kind of conversations into uh, both into like new staff and into the hiring process. Um, cause I think that that can be a really good way to start good conversations when you're bringing folks in, into your institution. Um, and then you would, the, you have to address, of course, old issues in your current, I said catalog records, but anything. And like, that's, that's a doozy. Like that is, um, we are, you know, our institution has been here since I think like 1838 and, you know, like they're not that they have their catalog records, but there's words and things that have been around and like that just it takes time um, and being like this is like something to be gentle with yourself about and like to not be like not blame yourself if you made past mistakes like just moving forward and using these these guidelines to to move forward um, and there's you can start really small you can um, if I, th I don't, honestly don't remember what I linked there I think, it, I think Middlebury had picked a couple subject headings and like global edited them and then wrote a little piece about it. Um, that's a great that's a great place to start. And there's a couple um, a couple terms that are like well established as something that should be changed. And sometimes they make it into LCSH and sometimes they haven't yet. Um, but one that has made it into LCSH very recently, I think, was the change from using slaves to enslaved persons, um, and that addresses. Um, like a, there's a couple other like um, subject headings that that it, that um, that it affected, um, but that's one that you can you know global bulk edit, and I think that um, involving your community both by involving you know affinity groups within your community who might have lived experience to talk about this, and um, just like your patrons and your people who come to your library like write blog posts talk about it. Um, make it clear that this is something that's happening and that folks can talk to you um, and that it's it's a work in progress and perfect. Um, I have a ton of resources. Um, you're always welcome to email me. I don't think I put my email on this and I should have, but I'll, I'll make sure you're able to find me. Um, cataloging Lab is an excellent resource to start out. I love Cataloging Lab. Um, and then just to be mindful of time, I think that's pretty much how we doing, Lauren. Good. Okay, I'm happy to take questions. Question. I'm gonna stop sharing so that I'm not because like my for some reason I can't see um, people very well when I'm actually. How do I uh, stop sharing? Okay.
All right, now I'm back with my face. So yeah, happy to take questions, discussions, thoughts. Yeah, please, go, just go for it. My kind of thought is that we have so many priorities and I guess a lot of us work in libraries where we wear a lot of different hats. Yes. And that example where you said that libraries have to start small, like Middlebury, maybe some more examples of, I, I should look at that a little bit more because that is kind of the challenge is like, how do we address these things when there's all these priorities during our typical work week? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think um, like truly, it can be as small as bringing it up in a staff meeting, like anything that gets the ball rolling. And I so I, he, I really hear you that this is one of those things that like, if you have 500 ILL requests and patrons and everything like you, this, there's not, there's so little time and there's so little staff time. Um, and I guess my only advice is like, carve out a teen, even a teeny bit of time and get the ball rolling because I think the really powerful thing about something like this is sometimes people have just never thought about this before and it plants a seed and like even like talking about it a little bit doing one global edit and writing a tiny blog post which I like I it's that's it sounds small but it's going to take however many hours and yeah um it's yeah I, I really hear that um and I think too that there is, I will say as well though, there is a growing um, acknowledgement for the need of this. And that means there are some grants and things like that to hire even like somebody who comes in for like five hours a week and like does a couple things and writes a couple of posts and does, you know, writes up a maybe a bit of a policy. Um, so maybe that's something to look for. Um, yeah, but I really hear that. <laughs> I think going off of that, point that's also a strength to the consortia that we have in public libraries um, that work gets disseminated throughout yes. catalogers so that's kind of an upside for those public libraries that are part of consortia but yeah daunting tasks <laughs> yeah absolutely There are a couple of things that jumped out at me sure, that um, I just did a class on classification yes. last month, and we talked about the importance of documentation and how documentation from previous catalogers to future catalogers is incredibly helpful. And even if, you know, the work of individual records not being um, fixed or worked on. If you start with a policy that says, you know, going forward, we're going to be mindful about this. Um, that can also be very helpful. Documentation is so important. Yes. That's a really good point, actually, is you don't like even like throwing a line like that into your catalog and policy. You don't have to like go through all the style guides and you can just that's that's like an excellent way to start. Yeah, yeah. Please. Thank you yeah. for that, Jules. Oh, sorry, Deborah, you go right ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask too about the connection that you had mentioned because we have some people here. We have older staff that are really wed to connection. And then I'm trying to get more into record manager and trying to do more of my work through record manager. And yeah. we had this documentation all with connection. And now it's like I'm trying to go back and revise this for re record manager. And um, one of the things that I saw come out of the OCLC listserv a few weeks ago where I kind of got all, oh no, is they're talking about the connection browser and only having the connection client. And I'm like, please don't take away that connection browser. I'm like, I'm hoping they kick that can down the road. <laughs> yeah, I, Lauren, I don't know if you have thoughts on that too, but I also have been I don't know. Like, I really, our system is so is as it is. I have no idea what it's going to happen when it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I do believe that we have until April, um, to kind of get accustomed to connection. Um, and I, I think I said this maybe at our last meeting, but I'm happy to do like a tutorial and a walkthrough in 
in preparation for that. I don't know if maybe we would want to schedule like a specific webinar on that kind of thing. I think that might help people. Um, I have been using it for the last probably like two months or so. And there are some things that are really nice and intuitive. There's also some ability to change the interface and the way that it looks when results are presented. So there are definitely some, some pros, but it's always daunting to have to face a new interface. Um, so I think I think maybe doing a specific webinar on that would be helpful to people, maybe maybe in December or you know sometime before April. Um, I think that would be good. I can look into get putting that together. Uh, and Jules, I just wanted to thank you for that presentation and the reminder that starting small is, you know, uh, like, you know, not to bring it back to fractal theory, but making the pattern small and doing it small means it will get bigger and bigger. But um, I just wanted to share that um, I sometimes try because it can be very overwhelming to think about fixing one's backlog catalog, um, yes. which, you know, in some cases is enormous. Um, and, yep. ah, oof. and yep. you know, I think uh, thinking about moving forward and making sure that, you know, when I'm downloading records that they're very robust and that they have terminology that I agree with in there. But um, something I do here at Brooks is um, we have Weeding Wednesdays where I try and get the whole staff involved in what is leaving the collection. And I take pictures of the spines of everything that's weeding. So it gives people a chance to say, hey, no, we really need that. Or, oh, my God, I can't believe we had that still kind uh -huh. of a thing. And it's a nice way to sort of bring people's attention to books because I feel like, you know, there's the big things like slaves versus enslaved people. But then there's stuff like books on just fat shaming books that are like health books <laughs> from the 90s that are just like, wow, that's really not something we want on our shelves at all. Um, or even books on diabetes care where it's like, it's your fault. And you're like, wow cool that's not anything we want here so i think it's been great to just sort of as we're weeding to know what we have in our collection and then really look for you know every time i weed the whole collection of diabetes health books i obviously need to buy new ones uh, <laughs> that are fresh and, and up to date but i think um it can be a very small thing and it can be tied in with the tasks we already do every day, like weeding and inventory and stuff and just looking and checking and making sure that our collection does reflect our current values. So that's thank you, excellent. Jules. Thank you. That's an excellent point um, that it doesn't, it actually works best when you tie it into into things you already do and the, all the workflows that you already do. And thank you for mentioning weeding because I've gotten completely out of that headspace working in an archive because we keep everything. We just amend the record. And that's a totally like like getting rid of like outdated materials or like looking at content. Also super important. Like you can totally fold that into your like your reading workflow. Like that's a huge one. It's a huge one. Um, and can be really, really impactful. Yeah. And it totally falls under the umbrella of this kind of reparative description slash librarianship. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank yeah, we, we still had a uh, book by Bill Cosby on fatherhood that we were like, oh, oh no, 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 no. So, yep. you know, <laughs> it's, yep. things, things stick around somehow. <laughs> somehow, somehow. How is it there? But it's gone now. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I also really like the collaborative element of that, where you're getting, you know, on one side, a lot of um, talk around what language we're using is so community driven, which is great. Um, especially when, you know, at the end of the day, it's going to be the patrons looking for material. And this is all about can the patrons find the material, um, but then also getting other librarians in your in your library um, a little bit involved in thinking about that kind of thing um, as a more institution wide um, framework is fantastic. Yeah. yeah, and also it's it's helpful because I um, I'm a sort of new hire, you know, I only started here in January and you know, we have people who've been working here for years and years and years and they may know that we have a patron who needs all of those ancient Nora Roberts, needs them, must have them. Um and I I want to make sure that uh, everybody's knowledge is accounted for. So, yeah, it's a fun it's a fun thing. Plus everyone loves alliteration, so weeding Wednesdays for the win. Excellent. So good. That's awesome. Uh, uh, 
Well, you can, if you, people have thoughts and questions later, they can always reach out. Um, my, you can find my email at VHS, but it's just my first name on my last name at vermonthistory.org. Um, you can call us even. I'm always happy to happy to chat. Um, I'm really glad that, that Lauren invited me to do this because it's wonderful to virtually meet y'all. Yeah. Yeah, we'll make sure to include um, Jules's email on the agenda. That way, hopefully you'll get lots of communication. And I'm hoping that the round table will also be like a good place that if people are having successes with doing any of this kind of work, please bring it to future round tables because we all want to hear about it. Or if thing is or if things are especially difficult, we all want to hear about that too. <laughs> Thank you, Jules. I was wondering, uh, are these slides going to be posted or available for us to look at? I'd love to follow those links. Absolutely. I'll get them to Lauren and I'm sure yeah. we'll get them. Excellent. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Awesome. If there are no more questions, um, I'll pull the agenda back up. That was great, Jules. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, um, a couple of random things that have come up over the last month or so. Um, there was a question that was brought to me about what mark field should be used for noting celebrity book clubs like Oprah's book club or Reese's book club. And it looks like there's a lot of different options. I have seen um, a 020 field, an 830 field, a 500, or even the title 245 having that as like a sub field. Um, I think the jury's still out on uh, what field exactly this information should be represented in or if it should just be a 500 note. Um, but I would encourage people to keep an eye out for that specific um, information being represented in records because. I think it's a little bit all over the place at the moment. Um, there was also something interesting that I found in the um, in Dewey classification and how um, differentiating between fiction that is by an American versus fiction that is in English um, and the question of well where do Canadian works fall because you know Canada is part of the Americas as a continent um, so that was just an interesting conundrum that I had noted and then um, I want to make a plug for the Certificate of Public Librarianship. The cataloging core course is open. Um, I believe it has filled up. There is a wait list. People do fall off, so please join the wait list. Um, and we're also going to be offering it in the spring as well. Um, we don't have the dates just yet, but um, I'll send an email out. And people really are good about, like, getting on the list at eight o'clock in the morning when registration opens. I might change it to a bit later in the day, um, but it's a little bit of a rat race at the moment, but hopefully offering it more frequently will cut down on um, people being uh, destitute to the wait list. And then um, there, the recording is up of the classification class that was held in August. Um, we had a really great presentation from uh, Matthew Jaquith uh, from the Springfield Library in Massachusetts. And um, it was a really interesting talk. It gave a lot of good context and history about the Dewey Decimal Classification System. Um, the whole presentation was not about Dewey just itself, but his presentation did focus on that and using OCLC's um, rearrangement of the 200. So when it comes to religion, getting a broader framework um, and worldview worked into classifying in that um, area. So that was really interesting. Um, the recording is up on YouTube and also the technical, technical services page um, and our CE page as well. And as always, I am taking suggestions for future topics for CE. Um, I think doing a webinar on the new connection um, through OCLC maybe in December might be a good thing to do. So we will take that as a suggestion. And then um, news 
resources to share. If anyone has any cataloging news or anything that they would like to share, please feel free to jump in and let me know. Um, but going off of that, I did find a nice Vimeo video breakdown of um, the changes to connection and how you can search and find bibliographic records um, when you're copy cataloging. And that video just goes through that really clearly. And then also a very helpful element to that video is about setting the user preferences. Um, so how records come back and what that looks like. There's a nice tutorial there. Um, but I'm I'm happy to work that into a webinar um, in December about that. And I think last time um, I talked about how you may have to be the one to reach out to OCLC. That is the link there where you can um, just make sure that you have the right credentials that will work um, for the new OCLC World Share Connection interface. And then the last thing I'll bring up, uh, there are two links there. Jules had mentioned the cataloging lab because um, they do such a great job of rounding up all this various um, changes and shifts that are happening in the cataloging world, whether that be um, subject headings or language. Um, lots of good resources there. And um, the first link is the subject headings from Library of Congress that have changed recently because they always post their um, their new and updated um, headings, which can be a lot to sift through, but um, always good to keep an eye on, especially with what we've talked about already today. Um, there was, I'm going to stop sharing. I just wanted to make sure as well um, that people know, make sure I share the right window here. Okay, so this is the page on our website. Um, services for Vermont Libraries is probably the easiest way to get to it. And then just go down to cataloging and technical services, learn about cataloging will get you here. Um, this August 29th, I will update this with our agenda. That includes Jules' email and um, slides. And then this lives here always, a tutorial on how to use Clover to get MARC records. Just putting a, another plug in for that, um, that that is a resource to help with copy, copy cataloging. Um, and then hopefully that changes the screen. Can you guys all see the Niche Academy page? I just want to put in a plug that um, there's the cataloging classification class and all of our um, cataloging month materials are four different sessions from February. Um, while you won't get CE credit necessarily for watching these retroactively, it's still a lot of resources and you'll have access to all the syllabus and the video and the slides. Um, so if you're looking for those kind of things, Niche Academy is a great place to go. And then my last tab here, uh, I just want to make sure that everyone has used or might be getting comfortable with um, our new LibCal calendar, which has all of our events. Um, so I think the home page kind of looks like this, but it shows, you know, all the CE. It gives a little blurb. Um, hopefully to get to today's session, you went to our cataloging roundtable and was able to see the link here. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to go over those things. I don't know if I had in the past um, just for some logistical help. OK, that was a lot that I just threw at everybody. How are we doing? Are we good? Are we still awake? I should have warned people to like have coffee today. <laughs> well, I'm very glad that um, well, and I'm glad that Jules went through that presentation and we'll get those slides out. Um, and then also having the suggestion for going through connection because yeah, I think we have until April next year to to get adjusted. Um, so yeah, and I think that signups for the um, 
free downloads from the department will be opening uh, shortly, just in case anyone has not signed up um, for the Department of Libraries program to get access to cataloging records. Um, I think a lot of libraries should be all set on that. And if you're all set, nothing changes, um, but I'll send an email out about that. Does anyone have any successes or conundrums that they would like to share? Oh, oh, Ruth and Wendy are going at the same time. So let's do Ruth. <laughs> do Ruth. OK, yes. thanks, Wendy. Ruth, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, could you explain what the connection? I, I don't know what that is. I haven't heard of it or yeah, or what you just spoke of about signing up for the Department of Libraries cataloging because either I haven't heard of that or I'm not making the connection in my head. Thank yep. you. Yeah, let me pull up um, our program uh, about Cat Express. So I'll put this link in the chat. I can also share my screen either way. Um, but uh, basically, the Department of Libraries has a buying group, which just means that um, like 250, you know, an average of 250 MARC records um, can be downloaded through uh, the OCLC World Share, World Share portal um, for free at no expense to participating libraries. And it is free. There's a sign up link on that link that I just put in the chat, and I'm happy to put that on the agenda as well. Um, if you are part of the Vocal Consortium, um, oh, that page still lists Debbie, even though she's retired. Um, we'll update that. Uh, there is someone uh, for that consortium that handles everyone's accounts. Um, and then there is a tutorial for Koha libraries using Cat Express that is linked on that page. Um, so basically, it's just a resource that pulls from really like global catalogs to get records that um, you either can't get like through the Z39 connection in your ILS. Um, it's just a larger pool of MARC records that it pulls from. Um, they're usually very high quality and you usually don't need to do hardly anything to them um, in order to make them like accurate for your material. Um, there's also another link about um, uploading them into your ILS. And then there are some OCLC resources showing how to use that. Although, like I said, I think those things are going to change um, in April, but um, typically those, those changes, um, you know, we have a bit of time, we still have a bit of time. Um, and if you do have questions, if you're a new cataloger at your library and haven't used this before, and you think maybe there's a login, but you're not sure, um, if you reach out to orders at oclc.org, um, they'll be able to get your credentials. So that's like a really quick overview. Um, it just helps with copy cataloging. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a good program, it's useful. Um, and if you if you have more questions about it, um, please send me an email and uh, we can talk about. And I think I have a list of libraries that do have accounts set up. So if you're not sure, just send me an email as well and I can I can let you know if you're on that list. We do have 15 minutes, so I'm happy to um, pull up uh, World Share if people would be interested in that. I see that there is someone typing in the chat. So oh, I'll keep an eye on the chat. Um, Wendy, you had a question. 
Uh, it's not so much a question as as a, a conundrum. Uh, Great. Graf- graphic novels. Let's go to graphic novels. Um, you have options with graphic novels. Um, there's a Dewey number for graphic novels, which would imply that they're non-fiction, but the stories themselves are actually fiction. Um, so then when you consider the 008 field, how is it described there? If it's described as fiction there, should you be using the Dewey number? If you <laughs> and so the conundrum goes on. Um, it's just one of those weird things and has anyone got any ideas, thoughts, suggestions? Um, how, especially how, uh, as part of a consortium, we have some people that definitely put them in fiction and some people that definitely put them in nonfiction. And, and hey, you know, that's not quite consistency. <laughs> So that's as far as my conundrum goes. Yeah, I have thoughts on this, but I don't want to be the first person to answer because I've talked so much. So if anyone wants to jump in first, please. Well, this was uh, Wendy is is right to bring this up because we talked about this in our our Catamount Library Consortium Network uh, meeting, and that's part of where um, it came up is because whoopsie daisies, what do we do? What do we do indeed? And we, yeah, we got to the point of establishing it as a conundrum, but no further. <laughs> a great first step. <laughs> yeah, it, it, the first public library that I worked at, we had graphic novels separated out and they had their own call number abbreviation. Um, and there it was, you know, further separated by nonfiction and fiction and they would get I think GRA for graphic novel and I think this was you know adult graphic novels so not even youth or like children's Um, and they would get the Dewey number but they would get it more about subject classification than graphic novel Um, and then the fiction graphic novels would get like just the author name and treated like a normal fiction book, but in the graphic novel section. So separating it out by format makes a lot of sense to me. Um, The second public library that I worked at did not do that. They had all graphic novels in the Dewey section for like youth nonfiction, um, which I personally did not like because I think it's weird to have fiction in your nonfiction. So I, I, I typically see it more as a format option, but to even be flakier um, with the movement of putting, you know, more libraries I've seen in the last year or so are putting formats together to have like a book on CD, and the play away and the the physical you know book format all next to each other on the shelf in hopes that readers who want um, material can see that there's different options and maybe the audiobook on cd gets circulated more which i mean cd players are dying but you never know so once again, that then complicates it where, okay, are you treating it as a separate format and then having classification based on that in its own section? Or do you want a graphic novel next to its print book format on the shelf? So it's a big question. And I don't know if we're, I don't know if we're going to get consistency amongst every library on uh, how graphic novels are shelved, classified, labeled. But maybe consortium wide, you guys may, I think we need to have like a statewide debate maybe just about graphic novels. Would that would that be good? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone can uh, build their I mean, argument. Our system is further 
complicated because we have Aspen on the front end. And so that is collecting everything of the same title together on the same page, which then means that, you know, um, it's even funkier. <laughs> yeah, I could see that being an argument for putting them all together because think of how your user is going to approach that based on, you know, what's coming up in the catalog. <laughs> Yeah, despite my like, you know, like things together, group them, separate them. <laughs> if a patron is is uh, coming into contact with that material because the catalog is grouping them together, it might be worth considering grouping those materials together, even if the format is different. That might be um, an opportunity, which I know we all love because it's so easy and doesn't take a lot of time, surveying our patrons. <laughs> I say that sarcastically. Well, one of the points, um, and I'm also, I was also part of the Catamount discussion, but I think one of the points that when I consider what goes in the 008 for a fiction graphic novel, I think that should be showing that it is a fiction thing. Um, because it kind of, to some ways, I think of it like in the biography. Um, some libraries put their biographies in separate locations, and some of them put them under the Dewey numbers. And so I don't necessarily think there needs to be a correlation between the Dewey number and what goes in the 008. Yeah, that's a good point about um, what's what's in the 008 field. Yeah, that definitely adds um, a complexity to it. And I'm also thinking about, I know that I've seen like graphic novel adaptations of like Shirley Jackson stories. And it's like, okay, you're getting into the verge of, is that prose? Is that literature? Like, would we have that in the fiction section or would we have that in like the 813 or like short stories, you know, in our nonfiction collection? So once again, I, it's going to be different at different libraries, I think is the short answer, but all worth um, grappling with. And once again, thinking about the end user and how, how might they best access that material. I think it would be great to have some sort of larger um, forum on how does your library handle graphic novels and and how is it done? Because I think yeah, I think it is just it's so case by case. But I think it's probably something that all librarians are like ah about a little bit, and it might be nice to have a, a communal ah together about it. Yeah, this is definitely not the first time that uh, this has come up. I think in the intro class last year, graphic novels were were talked about when we talked about classification. Um, yeah, maybe maybe uh, the first roundtable of next year we could we could do like themed potentially, or maybe every other roundtable might be a theme, but that would be a good opportunity to dedicate some time to that specific conundrum. Yeah, I think that'd be great. Cool, I'm gonna write that down. For now, it will um, get written down on our agenda that we did acknowledge that it is a conundrum. <laughs> Finally, some consistency. We all agree that it's a conundrum. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think anyone would say this is not a conundrum. It should go there. And you all are wrong. <laughs> OK, well, that's great. Um, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Do we have um, any other questions that we want to address right now? We have five minutes. I would like to, um, Jules brought up something that our library doesn't have, and this goes kind of back to basics before we even get to the reparative stuff, um, a cataloging policy slash style guide. And I was wondering, does anybody have like a good example, a good 
guideline, a good suggestion of how to get started on writing or making that? That sounds like something that we could pose to the listserv as well. Um, and I don't think the department has examples of cataloging um, policy or style guides, but maybe that would be something great to have on the technical services page. So I think we might want to ask the listserv that. I'm happy to put something on the listserv um, asking for those policies. And I think there's a few that I found when I was looking at some of the stuff that I can pop on the slides too. I'll link them in. I'm, I'm That'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, great. I think that um, I have some things to put together and um, I'll, we have it recorded, so I need to hold myself to it. <laughs> It'll be easy to do. Um, but I think that if there are no more questions, we can probably wrap up a couple minutes early. Um, and I will put that question asking for policy on the listserv and we'll get slides, we'll get Jules' email. Um, I'll start putting together the works for a webinar on um, using the World Share connection from OCLC and um, we'll communicate about that. Thanks everybody for joining and thank you Jules for that really great thought provoking presentation today and thanks everyone for your questions. Thanks y'all. Thank, Thank you. Thank you everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.